Hello, Marco Polo here with another Valhalla Movement podcast, and uh, we've got a return guest. The first time we actually have a return guest based on uh, on on the, the, the you know the podcast that went on last year and last summer, and now this year, Daniel Vitalis, who blew my mind the last time we spoke, <laughs> uh, and his and his website and the knowledge that he drops on a daily is incredible. He's got um, a new magazine that comes out that's following the solstice. He's got newsletters that are following the, the lunar cycle. Like he's, he's got all kinds of information coming at you from all aspects of, of, of reality uh, or this reality, I'll say. And um, he's just a wealth of information, a spring of information to, 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 say, to be specific to the water that he drinks and stuff. And, and if you missed our last podcast, I'll put the links in, in below. You can definitely go check it out. There's going to be tons of information we sp that we kind of spread and talked about last year pertaining to the water sources and energy and all kinds of stuff. And uh, this year, Daniel seems to be up to even more. I mean, he's got a, a, a thriving shop uh, called Sir Thrival. SirThrival.com. We'll put the links in the, in the description below as well. Tons of information. And for the people listening to this, there is a coupon code that is valid from today, um, so the Friday to May 5th, where you can get 10% off any goods or anything that you buy through Thrival.com. So if you guys, you know, jump on that opportunity, make sure to, to make it happen. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for, for being a guest on our podcast again. Yeah, wow. Thanks a lot. No, it's great, it's great to be back. Great to talk to you again. So, uh, I mean, what's up? What's going on? What's happening in the, in the, in the hood of Daniel Vitalis? Yeah, well, it's spring again, which is exciting. Uh, Putting my obstacle course back together out here on the land where I live and um, finally sleeping outside again, which feels really good. It's been a long winter. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's it's been just, you know, I've just been promoting this idea of rewilding and watching it grow from this really obscure little niche into something that's actually starting to, to reach out into more mainstream subcults, I guess. So it's been really exciting to just... See, you know, I mean, I've been I've been sharing this message now. I think about probably about six years, and it's just amazing to watch a thing grow and watch it take hold and watch what happens when you water it and watch yeah. it just come to life. And um, seeing how many people are really understand. I guess when I started teaching this stuff, the consciousness wasn't just you know it was obscure still, and now I feel like people are really getting what I'm talking about. Now it's just it's really exciting. It's flourishing. I mean, how do how do you attribute that? Like, what do you attribute that to? Like, other is it is it just like more people are waking up, quote unquote, to 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 this kind of idea, or do you think it's just that like social media and the the exponential growth of that kind of stuff is like allowing it to thrive? Like, do you think do you think it's more to do with just your message getting more and more solid, or do you think it's more to do with just like your message continuing to grow and yeah. then the bigger you know the more leaves the more branches that the tree has the kind of the further it spreads, right? Yeah, so it's all that, right? Because I'm certainly I'm maturing in, in how I teach and then my information is matured as well. But then of course I have I'm just one voice and I have multiple colleagues who are teaching a similar message. Mm -hmm. So we're all getting it out. Social media is certainly helping us to disseminate that message. But I think the biggest part is that there is always, you know, consciousness is always evolving. Mm -hmm. And new ideas are always emerging. And usually what happens is the teachers who become prominent in any, at the crest of any wave started before the wave crested, right? Mm. So, and then when the wave crests, there we are and our body of work is developed. And so um, when I was start, when I started teaching this, the consciousness around what I was talking about was in the really the proto phases, but now I'm feeling that wave starting to crest and I feel like this information is really going to um, the, the wave is going to break and people are going to really get it. And then I'll get to go through that phase of teaching where I watch the new people come up with the information that's, you know, better than fast. yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, so, I get you know, that. It's, it's a cycle and, uh, but it's fun. I'm in a really fun part of it right now. Absolutely. I, I mean, from, from speaking from, from our experience with Valhalla, uh, and from my direct experience with Valhalla, just like, you know, we started about a year and a half ago officially, okay? Like in terms of two years ago, uh, kind of unofficially, we, we kind of went out on the land and planted a tree and we're like, we're going to do something here. And we knew nothing about, we never heard of earthships. We had never heard of permaculture. We knew uh, nothing about like anything. Like I was just a regular average Joe, just like living in suburbia, like just this kind of guy, you know, the kind of guy that, that 
went to school, did all these things, like had a job, and whatever. The lucky thing that I've always been is I've always been an entrepreneur since kind of day one. And I just I just knew I had to start. And we, we started and, you know, t talking about like how a plant grows. Well, look, spring is back. That energy is high again, like Fahala and everything's swirling around it and everyone kind of is excited about everything that's going on. And it's amazing because I could see the total progression of everything we've done. You know, like I... I always, like when I go to the land or when I when I go out there and I start gardening, I only see the things that need to be done sometimes. But every once in a while, I just kind of like whoop, crop yeah. back up and I look Big around picture. and I'm like, wait a second, we did a lot. Like there's yeah. like, there was no fruit trees. It was like air bare 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 land with a GMO corn and soya every year on rotation. And <laughs> yeah. we turned that into like there's a thriving field of clovers with like I was just working in one area yesterday and it was like. 20 fruit trees and I was just like oh man we planted each and every one of these like at some point wow. you know yeah. what I mean like and just this one little area of the land everything else it was yeah. berry bushes all these things so I, I, I it's sometimes humbling even for myself to be like wow this wave is happening and there is more people paying attention our sure, things are geometrically you know so it's like the, the growth isn't linear like along a plane it's like it grows and then expands and expands and expands so Watching a thing grow, and then you know, of course, a lot of us who are out doing things, we're we're overachievers. So it's really easy to not see all that we've done because we're so focused on what we think needs to be done. So Next. I know I have that the kind of blessing and curse. I guess. <laughs> and and what I'm uh, also excited about, and I, I know we talked about this last year, but going out to the spring again, uh, um, and it being nice, and being able to get that water again, that nice fresh yeah. glacial water that kind of melted on the mm -hmm. mountains and is now like kind of, uh, you know, refreshing the whole, the whole landscape. But then that spring is just nice and cold and, and, ah, man, I'm, I think I'm going this weekend to do it. Yeah. It's hard to beat that. Right. Once you've had that experience of drinking like earth filtered water, it's like, it's, there's just some, there's some living principle in that water. You know, it's still like yet to be scientifically described, but it's certainly experientially it's there and mm -hmm. you know, you drink it and there's this, enlivening quality to it so i mean yeah that's great to hear there's definitely something about it i heard first of all i heard uh that you won some kind of award or you're nominated for some kind of award or something for findaspring.com or something oh uh, yeah you know find a spring got you know nominated for a webby which is sort of like the grammys of the internet you know um uh -huh. And we have been sort of stuck in second place behind a government climate change website. <laughs> and it has felt like, I mean, a pretty boring website. It has just felt like a, some kind of government conspiracy or like they have, you know, they hire hackers or something because we just cannot seem to get, you know, like into that first place slot. But um, what so is that, that, it works with votes or something? Is that how it yeah, is? Yeah, well, there's, there's an award that will be given irregardless of votes, but then there's a people's choice voting system. Mm. So we watching and, you know, we, we, no matter how much we promote or no, how to, like, no matter how big a name we bring on to, you know, show this to their list, we just can't chip away at this government site. And it's kind of, it's a little fishy, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so we got nominated in the green category, um, which is really exciting because more than anything, I just want people to hear about the website and hear about this idea, you know, I feel like, I mean, this is so much of my work has been so fringe, you know, sharing this idea that, you know, you could live by drinking spring water and, you know, not have to drink out of the tap or buy bottled water. I mean, that's so obscure and fringe. And mm -hmm. yet tens of thousands of people have jumped on board with it. It's just been amazing to watch and to see that website grow, to see that community grow has been like, it's been humbling. Cause I mean, you know, this is sort of this weird practice of my own self obsession, and mm -hmm. um, but and yet it's been embraced. And so, the more people that hear about it, the more people jump on board. And you know, the long term goal is to see springs protected. I mean, that's just amazing to me that freshwater springs bubbling up in towns are not protected, at least by those towns, yeah. if not by those counties or states or governments, because these are like. Um, national heritage sites, mm -hmm. world heritage sites, mm -hmm. especially in a planet we know is going dry. It's like, how is it that these springs are just on the side of the road and there's garbage and there's old tires and rusted out, you know, broken teeth. I mean, people just trash these areas. It's yeah. amazing too. You know, people who go get spring water at the springs sometimes leave garbage there. Like, you know, this saying, I don't know if you guys say it in Canada, we have a thing here, like don't shit where you eat. Of course. Yeah. Right, but this idea of like going to the spring, filling up your water bottle, but like leave like an empty plastic, plastic. Yeah. apps, whatever there. It's like, 
you know, where you get your water, really? Like, uh, okay, but... You know, I think eventually um, what that website Find a Spring will do is is eventually um, as it grows and we get to the place where I can really nurture it more, um, we'll use that as a, a impetus to go to local towns, cities, governments and, and actually get them to invest in their springs and even help to invest in them so that they are turned into sacred sites mm -hmm. uh, available to people forever. Um, because this idea of having to buy water is to me just one of the most – I mean, it's. I, I think it's truly. Uh, that's the. That is slavery. Mm -hmm. When you're buying water to make your blood, wow, you're a slave. It's well, and and you're what you're buying, and in many cases, is, is, here's the other thing: they're buying convenience, right? Mm -hmm. It's like yes, it's more inconvenient, sort of, to go and get your water all the way at the spring. But it's a nice trip. We did it last year. We made a video about it, and I'm gonna tell you that it might be inconvenient on the on the on the scale of, of of what you see as important today but if you think about your body and if you think about like look at the end of the day our bodies are, are our own temple if you if at the end of the day if you're putting it in the worst foods and the bad waters and filled with fluorides or whatever it is that you you know the, the there's in your water your municipal water or coming out of your tap or in your bottled water you're hurting yourself tomorrow you're going to spend more time and more money and more effort trying to like cure yourself of the diseases and the problems and the sickness that you're getting out of it. And you're asking yourself, why is my energy low versus, you know, going out there once or every once in a while, bringing a whole bunch of glass canisters or whatever it is or, or, or things and filling it up and making it happen. And we did it last year. And luckily, uh, the water, the spring water we went to is managed by McGill University. So they basically oh. bought this whole mountain area where the spring comes out. And it's actually kind of preserved and it's like a natural, you know, people can go there for hiking and, and walking and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a great, nice little area. Uh, they do, you know, some maple syrup production and stuff right near the spring. So it's great. We went there. It was super clean. It was super fresh. We drank straight from like the water gushing out, out of the rock kind of thing. It was fantastic. And we took that back and we actually went home and used some of that water and we made Ormus. And I'm assuming you've heard of Ormus before. Yeah. So we made an Ormus potion, basically. For people who don't know what Ormus is, it's basically a potion for plants that help them thrive. You, people, you know, we can use it in compost teas or those kind of things. But basically what you're doing is creating a mixture that's going to help your plants grow way bigger than they used to and actually produce some fruits and we um, – our bigger fruits. And we Ormus certain beds in our garden. We ormus certain trees, and then we didn't ormus the other ones. And we looked at the difference in the f food production and, and the healthiness of the tree, and we saw so much more health. In some Did of you the really? Trees. Totally. And it was incredible. Like the ormus um, and the water that we had. Like you know, everyone says you know water's water, but not really. There's 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 something about certain water yeah. that is better for for life. Clearly. Um, and I think last time we also spoke a little bit about biophotons and that kind of stuff. You know, if you have living water, if you have good, strong, mineral-rich water, it's going to make a huge difference in your life and your plants' lives and in just the world around you for sure. So definitely suggest You know, there, there's a few things that are really interesting about about this. There's, there's um, biophotons you, you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some really interesting research. You know, when you first hear that term biophotons, it kind of sounds like kind of a new agey concept, like, but it's actually, you know, there's evidence based scientific studies showing that living things, living cells are emitting photons, right? That we are like light emitters. We do have a light body component mm -hmm. and that that can be found in food. And, um, so that there's one potential answer there that those biophotons are in water somehow. Um, another idea um, that's been proposed is, is a sort of fourth phase of water um, that uh, is a different molecular arrangement than H2O, and there's a lot of research now in that area. Um, there's this thing of ORMIS, which are orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. These are sometimes called stealth atoms, mm -hmm. atoms from the platinum group of metals, like gold, platinum, palladium, osmium, ruthenium, and iridium that are in a different form so they can be hidden in matter and not necessarily perceptible to normal um, spec spectography, spec 
just how do they look at minerals? Uh, like yeah, Spe- like the, the spectrum of, of spectrography. Anyway, so that aren't normally like something we can see. So whatever it is, it, it appears that when water goes through its filtration processes, bottling processes, all its processes. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we're talking about processed water, but yeah, it's good. There's something that goes away. It's not there anymore. Um, but it's there when you go to the spring and when you drink that water at the source, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. It feels like water is being poured directly into your cells. I mean, it's incredibly enlivening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, for me, it definitely changed my perspective. It, it opened up to a solution. That's really what it was for me is that, you know, I had learned about fluoride, like uh, a lot of people learn on the internet about some of the, the problems, right? But we are often, like you see a documentary and you hear the problem, 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 but there's often very little about the solution. It's like, well, what do I do? Like you're telling me, okay, it's a problem, it's a problem, but what, yeah. what am I supposed to actively do? And I loved that find a spring and that what the, everything that you say, everything that you're, you're putting out there, all the products, all the things that you talk about, you talk about, yes, the issue, but you really talk about the solution more than anything. Yeah. From my perspective, and when I look at, you know, I was we, I was watching a video where you made uh, toothpaste, right? Some some basically your own homemade kind of version of, of toothpaste, and I was like, well, here it is. Um, we talk about okay, yes, there's problems in our toothpaste. There's all kinds of chemicals and things that probably shouldn't be there. Again, here you are going and and making the toothpaste, showing how it's done, and saying like, look, you can do this at home. Like this is strategies. You know, we need strategies basically to get exactly. we strategies to get through it. So. Um, you know, it's funny you brought up Florida a couple times. I, I was just in a in Austin, Texas, giving some talks there, and this idea emerged between my friend Arthur Haynes and I. We were discussing. Uh, we were about to do a panel on shamanism, and so of course, in that conversation, there was uh, quite a bit of conversation about um, entheogens, right? Psychoactive mm. um, molecules, particularly from plants. Um, that used to be called psychedelic plants, but now we use this term entheogen. And entheogen is a word that means to f- have a religious experience that comes from within yourself, right? So mm-hmm. N means in, to gen, to generate, mm-hmm. theos, God, right? So it, it generates a God experience within yourself. So we were thinking about that, and then it was like, well, what's the opposite of that? Like, what's fluoride? It's an atheogen. <laughs> right? It actually blunts your ability to have a spiritual experience. Mm. So it does the opposite. It actually discourages you. It's a molecule that accumulates not just in your osteous tissue. In other words, not just in your bones and teeth, mm-hmm. but it accumulates in your pineal gland. Yes, and pineal calcifying gland. Your, your pineal gland, yeah. basically. So calcium accumulates in the pineal gland, and then fluoride, because fluoride attaches itself to phosphorus in places where calcium should be. Mm -hmm. Basically, the body kind of thinks the fluoride is calcium, and that's why it'll accumulate in the teeth. Well, it'll accumulate with the calcium in the pineal gland. So so it becomes like an atheogen. It basically makes us less spiritually aware. Mm -hmm. It, 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 It discourages us from experiencing the interconnectedness of things. From see, feeling like there's a spiritual component. And that just right there explains exactly how it pacifies us, right? People know fluoride pacification, right? That's what they kind of, they've heard before. Some but people. Have, some people, yeah, not everyone. But some people, the people who have kind of heard it but never really looked into it. And then here you go, again, very, like, proper explanation, proper understanding of what's actually going on. And then, and but not only did you say that, but now you have solutions. Hey, don't drink the fluoride. Here's the toothpaste. Here's this. You know what I mean? Like that's this is what this is what our world needs. Like, you know, people ask me, well, do you believe that the world's going to change even if you build an earthship or you build a community or whatever? I say, well, I know that my world's going to change first of all, and if my world changes and other people come into my world and see that my world is potentially better or or at least equal or on par with like the the standards that they are currently living in today. And yet they see a certain degree of freedom and a certain degree of like happiness and healthiness that, that I bring to it and a passion that comes with it. Then I think, yeah, I think it can change. You know, it's like the first time I walked into an earthship or the first time I heard about it, it changed my perspective as, as to, again, hey, here's a potential solution that we can make. And if we do that more and more and the more and more people do that, and we talked about this at the beginning, the more and more people open themselves up to this knowledge, the more it spreads again, the more it kind of becomes adopted. It's like... How many people are going to try the toothpaste that you kind of put out versus, you know, saying, hey, well, I'm going to wait until somebody else tries it, see what it's like, and then maybe I'll taste it or try, give it a shot. Uh, and then uh, the uh, second they see that, boom, now all of a sudden they're, they're doing it. You know what I mean? So there's this 
there's this thing I've been thinking, it's sort of a theory I've been putting together, you know, my line of work. It's kind of my job to come up with cool theories, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> one, one theory, you know, that we've come up with in the last couple of years, um, which I'll give as a backstory, and then I'll get to the new piece here, is the, the idea that human beings, which are homo sapiens sapiens, you know, a type of great ape, that we are a domesticated species, mm. subspecies. Mm-hmm. All right. So the background, if you know, if you're listening to this, going, what's he talking about? Um, there are a suite of mammals that have been domesticated from their wild progenitor. A great example would be the cow. You know, the cow is not a natural organism. We don't find wild cows anywhere. Mm-hmm. But there was an animal called the auroch or Bose primogenius, is its scientific name. It's now extinct. But from that animal, we bred out the cow. Mm-hmm. So here we have the cow. And it came from a wild animal. Now, the cow we call Bose Taurus, and its ancestor is Bose primogenius. Um, the same could be true of plants. So we have, um, and you guys where you live will have it growing there, Lactuca seriola, the wild lettuce. Mm-hmm. But that's not what we grow in our gardens. We grow Lactuca sativa, the domesticated version. version so whenever you it. domesticate something, you reduce its ability to live in the wild. Mm-hmm. You breed it in captivity. You alter characteristics about it. You suppress its wild behavior. It burns when it goes out in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, because it's less capable of living in its natural in wild natural, environment. It yeah. requires, you know, if you think about a wild lettuce, you know, you don't want wild lettuce ending up in your lawn because it's not going to stop growing. It's just going to take over. It doesn't need to be fertilized. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need to have its soil fluffed up in the morning like a bed. Oh, here you go. It doesn't <laughs> need to be watered. It doesn't need to be shielded. Yeah. Bugs don't eat it because it contains bitter medicines. Mm-hmm. It doesn't need us to take care of it. But the lettuces that we've developed for our gardens, I mean, could you get more of a like a, a, a maladapted species, right? I mean, I love lettuce, but it's like, come on. The thing can... It needs literally needs its soil turned. It needs to be watered. It needs to be fenced off. It needs to be poison spray. All the things that people do just to get this weak thing to grow. Now, mm-hmm. human beings are Homo sapiens sapiens. We say that, and we don't make it. No, imagine this: there's a hundred tribes still left, New Guinea, South America, and India that have never been contacted by civilization. Can you imagine? That's there are a hundred tribes of people who don't know. <laughs> That there are iPods, iPhones, internet, you yeah. know, or even even like clothes, Anything. even factory. They don't. They're not even tuned into this. They're completely uncontacted. But they they are living in the wild. They yeah. are wild humans. So there is there is a progenitor to us, wild humans, and we are the domesticated form. Mm. We can't live outside. We're like, oh, the bugs, the cold, <laughs> the heat, the moisture. I can't. Do- we need all this gear. We need people who go into the wild sometimes die, mm-hmm. right? If you get stuck out there, you die, die yeah. which is funny because the wild lettuce doesn't die outside. It just lives outside, right? But our, but our lettuces, they die, right, if they're not t- cared for. Well, we're the same. So, so I say that we are a homo sapien domestico fragilis, the fragile domesticated subspecies <laughs> of homo sapien sapiens. In other words, and when, when the colonists arrived to Canada and the U.S., there were Homo sapiens here. They mm-hmm. were the wild hunting and gathering, the foraging Native American peoples, the or you guys call First Nations, right? Yeah. Those were wild peoples. And then domesticated people showed up and attacked them with all of their industrial weapons and diseases from, from inner cities and wiped them out, right? Yeah. Okay, so the conquest is ongoing. It's not over. We, you know, it's not like Manifest Destiny ended. Slowed it's down a little bit, but there's a <laughs> hundred. Tri- yeah, there's a hundred tribes left, but they're, you know, this is the last generation, right? They're going to probably, unless we, unless we protect them the way we protect tigers and elephants, this is the last generation, and our progenitor will be gone. And again, the fact so, that we're going to even try to protect them is going to just could ruin it. It's, right. We're ruining it. That's domesticating yeah, yeah. it again. It's like you, we're going to encapsulate mean, them in this area. They're going to eventually sure. leave out of there because whatever. And what, what is that then? It's like a – It's like a. what would you call that? It would be like a game park or something? Yeah. So, you all right, like so then, a zoo it, out of them. You know what I mean? Like, well, now like, here you just hit it. Okay, so here's the question. If we are domesticated, what is this place we're living in? Mm. You just hit on the word zoo. Now, here's the thing about zoos. Zoos are a place where you take wild animals – Mm-hmm. You put them in a place where you cr- recreate an artificial form of their habitat. You recreate as best as you can their natural diet. Obviously, you know, we can't import to New York City Zoo all the wild foods chimps would eat, but we can make a diet as close as possible. 
We make the environment as much like their natural environment as you can. Now in a zoo, the animal's not ever killed for food. The animal's not expected to work, mm. right? The animal just does what it wants all day. If you're lucky, that animal will breed in captivity, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to keep going and getting more from the wild, right? But this is a wild animal, and any expression of its wildness in a zoo is a celebrated phenomena because zoos are a place where we study, conserve, and get amused by wild animals, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this place, sometimes it's fun to joke like, oh, civilization's a zoo for people. But guess what? It's not because a zoo is a place where wild animals live and we are the domesticated form. So what is a place where domestic animals are raised? That's called a farm, right? And on a farm, you raise domesticated animals for meat, food, or labor. Mm. Labor. And the domestic animals, you want not to express their wildness. So what you do is you breed them into a weaker form where they can't express any wildness anymore. You breed the desire for freedom out of them, right? Like our cows and our sheep and our goats. This is such a you, good you, analogy. You do not feed them a diet that looks like their wild diet. You feed them a diet that's altered for maximum output and yield. You turn them into an economic unit. Mm. You don't care what they eat, right? Like cows should eat grass, not grain. When you feed them grain, they get sick, but you don't care because you're going to kill them before – See I'm sitting, where I'm going with it? Yeah. So, so you don't care about their longevity or health. In the zoo, you want the animal to be as healthy as possible because uh, you want it to have longevity. But in the farm, you don't care. You want to kill that animal after it's either where it meets the best or when it stops producing the labor that you need. So you have no investment in that. Another thing about the zoo is in the zoo, you keep the animals intact. But on a farm, you do things like cut tails off, cut beaks off, mm -hmm. clip ears, or in our factory farm for humans, cut foreskins off, right? You, you do these mutilations to the body parts, and then there's um, expectations of work for the animals living there, right? So when you look at – another thing about a zoo is in a zoo, you keep the population in a very healthy either, – either at carrying capacity or below. Mm -hmm. But on a farm, you try to pack as many animals as you possibly can yeah. into one space, right? Now, human beings, domesticated human beings, here we are living in our, in, our, in our farm. But it's not just a farm. It's not like old McDonald's farm, is it? It's mm. more like a factory farm. It's an intensive farm for humans. Natural humans live in tribes of about 150 people. Yes. We definitely don't live in cities of multiple millions of people naturally. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a feedlot. And, of course, we're not currently raising humans for meat, um, except for rare black market circumstances. But... We are raising humans for labor and particularly taxation of their labor. Mm. So what's going on is we're living in a factory farm, but people on the farm think they're free. They're not actually free, but some are free range, mm -hmm. right? So we have socioeconomic – A little bit more range. Some have a little bit more range than others. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so if you live in the ghetto, right, you have, you're less free range. You're more intensively farmed. You're like a chicken in one you're of those really like – in there, yeah. Yeah, stacked and packed cages. Mm -hmm. But if you're wealthier, you might be suburban. You're more free range. Mm. But of course, you can't just strip your clothes off, leave your job, and just go live wherever you want. You're not really free. You're just free range. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a cow on a free range farm isn't free to leave. It's just free to walk around a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. So similarly, here we are. We're actually living on an intensive factory farm for humans. We are breeding in captivity. Then we're born in captivity. You look at a human hospital, you look at the maternity ward, and it is like a high-tech version of how you bring cows into the world in a, in a, in a feedlot. Mm -hmm. right? it and we also does. go through legal captivity as well, right? The, the whole, the whole like, um, incorporating your name, basically, so your name and capital letters on, your, on your, all your passports and your sure. IDs and all that stuff. There's a legal yeah. captivity to it too, right? Your birth certificate is, is less... Is less about like, oh, this is your baby and his here's his name. It's more like, okay, this is your baby. When he's eighteen, he's gonna be, have the right to vote, but he also has to pay his taxes. He has to do this. He has to do that. Like certificate all of this, birth. Yeah, Product certificate of like slavery, birth, basically. Yeah. So, so that exactly. Now, here's the thing. Unlike cows, we have this really developed neocortex. So you have to trick people. See, you know, in the past, we did try to just like African people were brought to this continent and forced into slavery um, at threat of pain of death, right? So mm -hmm. 
they were beaten into submission and forced to work. Now, what do we realize eventually is this isn't, a, this isn't good for the farmers. This is hard for the farmers to maintain, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and what's easier is if you can get the, the chattel uh, to believe that they're free. That's the key, right? If you can get them to believe they're free, then you don't have to intensively police them. Imagine what it was like for the slavers to try to intensively you know, possess Rest- the Africans, yeah, right? And, restrict and then them what they figure out is, wait, wait a second, Africans? Let's just make everybody into slaves. Like, why pick anyone? Let's let them all think they're free. We'll let them all free range, right? But in the end, what we do is we harvest their labor and we harvest that we tax their labor mm-hmm. in addition to harvesting it. And we do all this work for the, the farmers, right? The, the farmers, whoever they are, those hits, sort of they, them and their hidden agendas. Yeah. Um, and we work under the impression that there's some great global effort underway, like as if this is the this I think is an important question for anybody listening to ask themselves, like what's the point of what civilization's doing? What's the point of all the technology? Why this Why? willingness to destroy everything, the earth, the habitat, all the species who live here with us? There's this idea, like, well, we have to keep moving forward. It's just we have to keep going, like there's a goal, mm-hmm. but ne- no one ever says what the goal is. Is the goal to build ships and leave Earth and colonize space? If so, let's state it. And is the goal to create super intelligent machines to replace us? Well, if so, let's say it. Is the goal to develop machines we can download ourselves? Like, what are we trying to do? Mm-hmm. What is the point of all this? Because we're, dis- we're burning the planet and its ecosystems behind us. We're creating the fifth extinction. And no one ever talks about why. We don't even know what the goal is. And we're working to do it. Mm-hmm. Without ever stopping to ask, we we are a lot like cows. We know we're we're afraid to jump the fence and run away. We don't. It's been bred out of us. Guaranteed. I mean, you, you speak personally to my heart when you say this kind of stuff. Like, I personally had a, uh, had a, one of those experiences where where God is came into me, right? Whatever God is, and I had a psychedelic experience um, with the aid of you know psychedelics, <laughs> and. I asked myself that very question. Why? Why are we doing what we do? Why am I going to continue to uphold what my my mom or my family or society or people want me to do? And why don't I try and kind of get back to some of the things that, that really matter? And what is it that matters? You know, and the only why that I can come up with for society is freedom. And I was like, well, okay. The, the best, most altruistic, altruistic kind of why that we could possibly have is freedom. And yet everything you're doing, and you just, you nailed it. Everything you just said is, here we are on the farm and the zoo is kind of like, you know, maybe the celebrities are in the zoo and, and some of the, the higher ups are in the zoo and then we're on the farm and, and some of us are more free range than others. And, and that's beautiful analogy. And it's totally true. Okay. Because I see it. And I'm sure everyone listening to this is like, yes, you're right. And all of that we're trying to kind of do for freedom. Like that's what the, the United States was like really founded on. That's what like Canada, everything is all about like freedom, 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 freedom. And yet what could we do for true freedom? And, and that's where to me self-sustainability came to mind. I'm like, well, we have to be self-sustainable. That's the only way that I can be fully free range, do whatever I want to do is if I generate my own food if I, if I can, or, or find it, you don't have to generate, I don't have to breed these weak plants, like you said, if I can create the environment where the food is naturally thriving through things like permaculture, through things like, you know, foraging and all that kind of stuff, and then allow myself the most amount of freedom from the grid, from, from the polluted waters, from the polluted, you know, chemicals that they put on the foods, from the polluted everything that is around us. And that is our best chance of freedom. Like that's, that's the, at least my, my definition of our best chance of freedom. Other than we would have death. a lot of other options at this point. Yeah, either, other dude. than death. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Here's what's precluded, right? We can't. So, unfortunately, this is the thing I get. I got a chance to be on a national TV spot the other day on a news show, you know, nine minutes to talk about rewilding. I mean, it's not enough time, but I'll do what I can. Clearly, yeah. But of course, the, the people are going, well, you know, you, you can't, we can't all go live as wild foragers again. It's like, yeah, I know, give me 10 minutes and I would have said that. But. <laughs> Um, no, but we, we can't. Yeah, absolutely, we can't, right? So we have 100, 100 uncontacted tribes. We're not going to go add ourselves back to that, right? That's the challenge. That world is gone. The, the, the earth, 
you know, what we think of as nature is not what nature was like prior to agriculture. Absolutely. There's not a lot of wild nature left, and that nature produ produced a lot of food, but what we have left, you know, these clear cuts that have regrown, they don't produce food the way they used to. The animal species, the populations are less than they used to be. The plant populations are less. So here's, I mean, and I know it's grandiose, like here's my solution to the world's problems, but <laughs> here, here's, you know, it is something I think about a lot. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're on a farm. Some of us are in the factory feedlot. Some of us are really free range, but we're all on the farm here. And I have a strong suspicion that even the farmers are on the farm, right? That's the nature of this beast is like, it isn't like some other species is doing this to us, I hope. Yeah. Um, it appears that we are doing it to ourselves. It's our, it's our own nature. Like, you know, like a bacteria spreads and kills itself and it has nothing to feed off of anymore. We're the exact same thing. We're no yeah, different. And, and our civilization takes on an, uh, a life of its own. Mm -hmm. And it once it gets going, it becomes, it has its own will. Like it, it does not want to die. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like an you know, like civilization, hence the infinite growth paradigm, right? It's civilization going, no, I must continue. Okay, so what we can do is start to transition because we can't go back to wild, at least not right now, but we can transition from the farm to a zoo. Here's what I mean. In permaculture, mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're taking an area of land and particularly, usually you're taking an area that needs some loving because it's been beat on for a while. No kidding. So you're taking a piece of land and you're reclaiming it. You're cleaning it up and you're turning it into a human habitat. Mm -hmm. So like as if you were a zoo and you were going to say, okay, we're going to take these people and <laughs> Put them in a zoo. Let's make the habitat like, like as much like it's not going to be as big. You're not going to have a hundred miles to roam, but let's make it as much like your natural habitat as we can. We want, we want the foods that they eat growing there. We want it to be green and flourishing, right? We want clean water there. We want other species because humans aren't meant to live in isolation. We need other species there. Mm -hmm. and we want these people to interact again with the environment, mm -hmm. right? We create a habitat where they can move again because, you know, our <laughs> this way that we live like we're little robots, right, with our chairs and our couches and our desks and our, our workout routines where we move like <laughs> robots and all this weird stuff, um, we're actually a type of eight, which means we want to move naturally. So in the permaculture place, we set up to, its topography. There's places where humans can go and move and, and exist in nature again. Mm -hmm. So the idea is like we create these zoo habitats for ourselves. We're not totally free wild again, but we are in a something that's a lot better than – and the thing is, is you, you called it freedom. So once you're in that and you're producing your needs or you're interconnected with other groups who are doing and you can trade like mm -hmm. humans now do, mm -hmm. then we start to become self-sufficient. Because remember I said on the, in the zoo, we don't go to the zoo and see that they're making the chimps do labor, right? The chimps aren't like building – you know, fact, they're not like making clothes for you know the first world or – making mm -hmm. license plates or something like prisoners, they're just hanging out all day. And which is kind of, I think, where we all want to be at, right? What do we want to do? We want to hang out. We want to be, this is a little controversial, but we want to be able to do drugs. Um, that is what indigenous people, you know, it's not like all day, but they, they definitely have access to entheogens. And, 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 and drugs have to be, you know, we, we, let's, let's nail this Ron, right on the head right now. Drugs don't have to be just like uh, weed and, and psychedelics. They can, you know, you eating, f f you know, f uh, gluttonous foods or, or uh, coffee or cigarettes or all these things are drugs, okay? Like everything is yeah. drugs. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that. what yeah. about things like coffee or cacao which occupy the weird in between <clears throat> nebulous zones? Exactly. But we we want to and we, you know, we want to have sex, right? We want to have like cuz human doubt. beings are a social animal. We're actually one of the most hypersexual species on the planet. Mm -hmm. Um we want to be able to have sex. We want to be able to have really good music, right? We want to get together with our friends, make music, dance around the fire, right? Mm -hmm. Human beings are into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This is what we do in nature. Yeah. So when you get human beings in a tribe, you find that they, they, they do sex, drugs, rock and roll. That's kind of the thing. And that we want to be free, and we want to be out on the land, and we don't want to have to work for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of want it to be, at least for now, more like a zoo than a farm. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is we can start to create these pockets like you're talking about a permaculture and there's a pocket here and a pocket here and in and around it's the feedlot, right? That's what's a feedlot everywhere. But if we can crowd the feedlot out and we can grow these permacultures and they can start to internetwork again, obviously eventually we can start to fill that in, turn this place first into a zoo and then maybe one day back into a wild paradise. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I don't see another strategy. We're not going to get any more free going deeper into the feedlot. And, and the solutions that we hear from the farmers are constantly more legislation, 
more rules, and they it's more in the same way that that Monsanto can make a commercial that makes you feel like they're doing good things. In the same way that you can you can make you know by calling a thing organic and putting a green label on it, it can feel like it's something a lot cleaner than what it actually is. Mm -hmm. In the same way, we keep getting told how free we are. And then I love when there's like an attack, terrorist attack, something like that. Everybody rallies around. We're free. They hate our freedom. It's like, <laughs> you suckers. You suckers, really? You yeah. think you're free? So, you know, I think all they we just hate your farmers. farmers. That's really what it is. <laughs> What's that? They just hate your farmers. Yeah, yeah. They don't they hate your freedom. They exactly. just hate your farm. They don't, they they don't agree want, with your farmers. They want off the farm is yeah. what's going on. So anyway, they, um, you know, we, we keep being sold more and more um, rules, more legislation, tighter um, – tolerances on the farm and we're constantly told we're more free as a result um so i mean i think it's you know that whole mindset we have to divorce ourselves in order you know you don't have to um tell stories to a sheep to domesticate it you don't have to yeah. you don't have to tell stories to a cow they have a different kind of brain mm -hmm. but humans it's you really have to confuse them to get them to stay put on the farm you really have to get them thinking something other than what's going on is what's going on, and that's what's happened to us. Hence, you know, most confused. of us have been through compulsory schooling, which was designed to get us to think this is the way that we should live. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, schooling, number one, number one thing for sure. Education is everything. Like, you know, if, we, if we're going to talk about how do we transition from the farm to the zoo or from the zoo to the, to, to, to the wild, like all of it is going to be education. All of it is information spread. All of it is like more and more... It, again, more people hear about it, more people see the, the toothpaste or see the spring or see the, the techniques and things that we could do and see the, the benefits of them and, and the, the positive outcome of all of that, the more people transition to it. The more that we, we do unshackle some of the, some of the cows and the, and the animals and the, the, the sapiens sapiens and all that stuff, right? Like all of that kind of slowly dismantles and it is. It does come together. You know, there's, there's definitely for every person who... who it's kind of, re kind of escaping the farm and going into the pockets of zoo. You know, all that information is is gathering, and there's much more of it. And the internet has provided this this amazing way for us to share it. And you know, I said it. I said it just literally earlier today. I believe internet cens censorship is the next thing. It's like the thing that they're going to have to start controlling. I mean, if you know, they control this through the media, through television, through radio, through these kind of things. They distract us, right? Uh, you know, stop talking about uh, the the real issues and start talking about you know what Miley Cyrus is doing today or whatever it is. Like, oh my that's... god, she's sticking her tongue out and acting sexual. I can't believe it. Yeah, I'm so shocked. I've never seen that from a young female artist before. Yeah, oh, Madonna has never existed, and now it's yeah. all Miley Cyrus. Wow, yeah. oh my god, she's so scantily dressed. Can, what do you think about it? And and it, and it's. You know, it's not they, like, it's not the farm, it, it's not necessarily that the farmer's in control either, you know, because that's where, you know, my, f my ideas and all these things uh, came out of anger, personally, you know, I'm wearing a shirt that literally says, end the Fed, okay, <laughs> I was a conspiracy theorist to, to begin with, and then I educated myself on more and more of this, and then, you know, it's not necessarily just the Freemasons or the Illuminati or whatever it is, it's not just the bankers, not just these people, it's, it's humanity. We are that virus. We self police. And, yeah. We self police each other. And it's bigger. Exactly. Our neighbors police us. Our dog runs ran out of the. Our partners yesterday. who love us the most will do it. It's like what the way it, it, anything you want to do that's new and obscure. Unless you have a really unique group of friends, if you say like, let's say you say to your friends tomorrow, "Oh my God, I'm going to start drinking all my water from springs." They're, here's what they're going to say. First, they're going to act like you're completely crazy. Yeah. Then they're going to say, oh, my God, you're going to get sick. Then they're going to make a whole bunch of jokes about it. Then they're going to be like, are you going to boil it? Are you going to fill it? They're going to come up with all this stuff because we've been taught <clears throat> that any – well, you know, we're tribal in nature. We're, so, we're social in nature. So this is sort of natural to us. Mm -hmm. um, we want to all be doing the same thing, right? We Absolutely. want that. So then that gets hijacked. That system in us gets hijacked, and we're taught to police one another – so it's great for the farmer because you don't need as many um, farm hands. Mm -hmm. If you can get the sheep to police themselves, well, that's great. You don't need as many sheep dogs or whatever, right? You, so, so before absolutely. you, you know, before you need to involve a sheep dog, you let the people, you know, control each other. And we do it. And this is the thing: it's not like I don't ever do it. I do it too. We all do it. And it's something we all need to be on the lookout for: is, hey, am I? Am I policing other people? Am I am I attempting to restrict other people's options or 
Am I using peer pressure to convince somebody not to try something new? Because that's what happens very often, even amongst partic- you know very enlightened people. To be so, honest, I know- to be honest, it even happens in, in in you know I had the last podcast that I did, which is going to be coming out um, after this one, I guess. So the next podcast for those who are listening is um, you know the green movement. The environmentalists, the climate changers, all these people, all the people who had this knowledge, they in fact did the exact opposite thing of what we should have done, which is that they tried to police more. They tried to impose, they tried to create more laws and more things to to make this happen, as opposed to create a positive message surrounded with the solutions and say, hey, this is better. As opposed to doing that, they were like, no, be fearful. You you watch this movie and all this stuff and, and do this and do that. And what you're doing is wrong. Nobody wants to listen to that message. We're all just going to do what, as you said, what everyone else is doing. We, we're we social creatures and we're going to try and stick to the social norms because that's what feels comfortable for us, okay? Mm-hmm. And and it's fully natural that we do that, you know? Even a, a wild animal sticks to a certain area because he – and he lives in a certain area because that's what he knows and he sticks to that area, okay? And, and he doesn't necessarily always venture too far. They don't migrate. Not all animals are, are these big migrators and even when they do migrate, they migrate right back. They, get, they go, they leave, they, they stay in that environment, and they come back because they're comfortable here. And we are the exact same thing. We have, to, we have to create a positive solution, and we can't impose it. We just have to do it. And it's, it takes a lot of patience, and it takes a lot of, of for me, <laughs> serious meditation to just, like, not go up to my neighbors at times and just shake them. Like they, they're freaking out about every little thing sometimes. Like you know, where where we're trying to build the zoo, and they're on the farm over there, and they're like, "Well, no, we want to preserve our farm." And I'm like, "Okay, cool, no problem." Like I'm not trying to change anything that you're doing. All I'm trying to do is do my own thing here. And yet, people are worried about the police state. The police state is in us. We're the police. We're the ones that are like, "Oh, we're gonna call the police if your dog gets out of the cage." <laughs> I mean, that's it's the truth, though. Oh, you stepped on my grass, and oh, you, you're supposed to cut the grass out over here on your lawn, and your grass is too high, and mine's shorter, and I, people can't see the beauty of my grass versus your grass. And, uh, what are you talking about? Where, where did we go wrong? Like, what? what? You're the police. What kind there. of world do you people want? Like, yeah. one where we're all uniform copies of each other living in our little domesticated lives? It's so funny, right? I mean... I, I don't think people really stop, like, you know that, like, sort of that, the voice of the, like, right wing, you know, the, like, every, you know, every man should have the same haircut, every woman should wear a dress, and we should all, every Saturday morning, all men come out of the garage with their matching lawnmowers at exactly the same time, and they walk in, you know, uniform rows, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that feels like utopia to you, that sounds like. That sounds like hell to me. How could you want this thing? I, I fully agree. I mean, a world where we, where we don't know our neighbors, a world where everything is like controlled and we have to, we're worried about dirt and we're cleaning everything. And we're like disinfecting and Lysoling everything. Like we're freaking out about everything. And it's just like, whoa, like we need to chill out. <laughs> we have to remove yeah. this out of and ourselves. So what evidence do you have? For this? this is the thing. It's like, okay, so it would be, it would make more sense if we saw that when you cleaned everything, you know, you sterilized everything and you did all these things that you got sick less and that people lived longer and that their quality of life went up and there was less disease. What's funny is that we have the most disease ever or the sickest ever or the fattest ever. We're dying younger each generation now. Only Cancer now, rates are through Only now. the roof. Degenerative disease is destroying. Oh yeah. Since we've started all this, mm-hmm. what's it? It's just interesting that like the medical paradigm to this day all of what it's do- there's nothing that it's doing is actually reducing the disease or mortality and it's not extending lifespan so why are we doing it the, the medicine claims to be evidence based but it's actually we're not we don't ever get to see any of the evidence it's not as if we're looking at these people going yeah wow okay this departure from nature seems to be really effective I'm jumping on board it's like i look at it going like not only does it not feel good it's not working um, how do you people not get it um, hang on one second i've got to plug this machine in yeah go for it so anyway, to, to those listening, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for listening. Please don't forget to subscribe. Guys, click the link below. Click the subscribe button. Click the like button. Anytime you click anything, anytime you comment, it helps us reach more people. And this is part of 
really what makes this work out for us and, 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 and reach more and more people. So please click that subscribe button below and uh, we're back. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, like, I mean, we're, we're in this sterile environment. We're in this, this weird thing where we're trying to control everything. And the more we try and control, the harder it gets, right? The more we try and control the plant that we try and grow versus the wild one that was outside, the wild one is so much easier to grow. The one we control, the, the domesticated version, it's so much harder to maintain. It's and more you, work. Definitely more work. And you brought up an example that I bring up all the time, which is everyone's idea of utopia right now is that we all have our own house and our own, you know, kind of grass lawns and everything's perfect and everything looks straight and we dot all our I's and cross all our T's. And you brought up the lawnmower example. And the lawnmower is the epitome of all examples for me. And I use this example all the time. I'm like, what would be better? Number one, the current situation, which is, I don't need to explain it, suburbia, lawnmowers, everyone has to go and mow their lawn, uh, you know, keep up with the Joneses. If Jones mowed his lawn once a week, well, we have to mow our lawn once a week too because our grass can't be any higher than his. And it has to be green. We have to add fertilizers and all these things. And it requires a lot of work, time, effort, money, whatever it is. Even if you're not doing it, you're paying for somebody to do it, okay? Tons of resources. Or even if you want the lawn, even if for for a moment we can think, you know what? Maybe grass is, is nice. There's something nice about the uniformity of grass. There is. I see a fresh I, – I don't love it. I don't. I would never have it for me. I'm a clover kind of guy, and we have an article on that. But anyway – but the idea is that even if, let's say, I can understand that you want grass, and that's reasonable for, for us to, to assume, wouldn't it be better that in some degree there is versions of improvement that maybe you would say, hey, what if instead of all of us having a lawnmower on this, on this street, what if we all invested in a communal lawnmower? And we all chipped in and we all worked together. We all cut the grass at the same time. We all just take turns and we'll all save time because... You'll mow the lawn this week. I'll mow it next week. Next guy will mow it the week after. We're going to save hours of time, hours of stress. We're not going to have to keep up with anyone because we're all going to do it together. And we're going to, we're going to pool our resources and work such together a as a community. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But such a com so, so the reality is what, though? We live in a competitive, under a competitive model. And, and where the everybody's supposed to have their own castle fortified with its own defenses fortified with its own internal economy, like its own moat, its own systems of control. And, exactly. and the idea, it's a battle, right? It's, a, it's actually like an arms race. Exactly. It the keeping up with the is. I need that lawnmower and you need yours and they're separate because we both need to take on the war of lawn independently. Exactly. I mean, we're, we couldn't be more on the, same, on the same wavelength. And that's exactly what I was getting to, is that everything you're doing is a fight. You're, you're, you're going out there and trying to fight your way and struggle and just like have your peace of mind and have that moment where you're free and you don't have to do anything and you could just chill. And the best way to chill is to chill. Like the best way is just like, it's like, no, I don't have to do anything to chill. Chilling requires chilling. That's the chilling's what it is. not a doing. <laughs> it's not a doing. It's just hanging out and relaxing and, and kind of instead of progress today, our version of progress is that it's not, to, 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 to make more laws and make more things. It's actually to just kind of break them down a little bit. Break down the, the, the stress that we give ourselves of trying to keep up with everyone else, the stress that we give ourselves of, of dealing with other people's pressure. And we tell this to our kids all the time. We tell a kid, a kid who's being bullied, hey, it doesn't matter. You can be, be who you want to be. Do what you love and, and be the kind of kid and, and the kind of person that you want to be because – Nothing will make that bully or angrier, you know what I mean? Like that's to some degree. And then, and then when we turn around and go back our, to our daily lives, we're not applying that exact notion to ourselves. Right. We tell our kids as, as parents, we have this, we're, we're good at parenting to some degree. We just send them to the wrong places to get more information. We're sending them to the wrong places for education. We're sending them to the wrong places and get, instilling them in them some of the fears and problems and stress that we just need to let go of. We so so we, I was saying before, we're, we're a domesticated version of humans, right? And the, the thing about domesticated humans is that 6,000 to 10,000 years ago, we started practicing agriculture. Mm -hmm. And before that, all human beings got all their needs from nature. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it certainly wasn't utopia, but when we look at hunting and gathering peoples, one of the classic surprises is how much leisure time they have. Because you would expect... 
the Flintstoneization that we have in our minds of them, the caricature, is that they are like, it must be poverty, hunger, working all the time, famine, wearing rotting skins for clothes, like this whole, when the reality is actually these people live very well, very sophisticated lives, and their needs come from nature like all other animals. Now, 10,000 years ago, this decision was made to start the agricultural process. So what do you do? You first, you have to clear away the existing nature somehow. Mm -hmm. So we're talking clear cut, a burn, something like that. Then you rip a hole in the earth and you create a wound. And that wound in the earth, we call it tilling the soil. That wound in the earth is um, what you're doing is you're replicating a small natural disaster. So it's mm -hmm. like as if you created a little mudslide or earthquake crack or something like that. And you create this wound in the earth. And then you fill that wound with annual plants. Now those annual plants in nature the wound like a band-aid and they would grow there until perennials could come back and the forest or the grassland could be restored. Mm -hmm. In other words, nature's always looking to fill in that wound back with what was naturally there, mm -hmm. right? Now, so, so 10,000 years ago, these people start this process in the Fertile Crescent, a little bit in Asia and also down in South America. And um, right from then, then on, those people were at war with nature. They were in a losing battle. It's a losing battle. I mean, this is Absolutely. why every civilization always collapses. But the idea, imagine it's like you're in a room and the walls are closing in, right? Nature's trying to always close in on your farm and trying to restore it back to wild nature. So there's constantly this sense of we've got to do, do, do and struggle and fight because if we stop, our way of life's going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So it sets in motion. The beginning of the domino effect is war, war with nature, competition against what's natural. Also, in wild nature, human beings um, are very egalitarian. So hunting and gathering peoples are fierce egalitarians. In other words, there isn't like necessarily a patriarchy or a, mo uh, a monarchy. It's, like, it's more that everybody works pretty equally, including mm -hmm. people of high status. So if you're the chief, it doesn't give you special rights to where you don't have to work anymore. Not like our commander-in-chief, right, who he gets to live in the biggest house and he, he you know, has him around all over. Right, and they fly around in Air Force One. So in a chief in a tribe still is a forager. Mm -hmm. He still has to make fire. He still has to care for his own lodge. He's got to work too. He just is appreciated for his unique wisdom and his leadership ability, let's say. But, um, but everybody is equal. Once farming starts, you've got to, you end up with classes very quickly because you end up with surpluses of food. The surplus of food means certain people don't have to work for their food anymore. There's extra. And it Once escapes that 150-person kind of range. Yeah, and you start to exceed that. And when you exceed that, that's when the, the element of accountability is like, oh, I can't keep up with the chief because I'm too busy working over here. So I'm not keeping up with the fact of whether or not he's working. And because I don't keep up with it and then certain little classes and, and things form, that's exactly how society happens. That's, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, you get you get the you get the, the the elite ruling class. Yeah, they need a priesthood to confuse the minds of the people. That's how we do that, right? To keep them working. Mm -hmm. Then you need a military and police class to enforce your power. And once those people have power, we all know it's not given up very easily. And so this has been going on for ten thousand years, but the root of it is a is a battle with nature. So our culture has built into it inherently, intrinsically. This sense of competitive, um, this competition in war, because that's what it is. And so, you know, it's to, I, when I, I mean, obviously I eat food from farms and, and I believe in this idea of permaculture because I think there's no jump back to what we were doing. But what I like about permaculture is it's, it's a form of agriculture that's less of a battle against nature and more of a saying, for the first time in 10,000 years, for the first time in 10,000 years, people have asked, Hey, is there a way we could do this with less of a fight against nature? <laughs> that would I mean, be a little bit easier. It took 10,000 years to come up with that. Do you, I mean, people don't realize like Egypt went from being a fertile valley into a dune desert from mm -hmm. organic agriculture. They used organic agriculture and they turned it into a desert. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what agriculture does, right? Civilizations collapse because they destroy their soil. And here we are at, in the same position, like just going like, uh, Maybe we're losing the minerals in our soil. Like it took us this long. Yeah. So, you know, permaculture, it's like, it's like saying, hey, how do I make less work out of this? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to work from, from sunrise to sunset 
doing back-breaking labor, hunting and gathering people's meet their food needs in 12 to 18 hours a week maximum. Mm -hmm. 18 hours a week maximum in the most harsh environments. That's, that statistic of 18 hours comes from the, the Bushmen of the Kalahari. That's the harshest environment you could live in. Mm -hmm. And it, they, they don't work 40 hours a week for their needs. It's like it's insane the amount of work we're expected to do on this farm to sustain a food creation system that is so horribly inefficient that not only does it barely give, barely supply our own needs nutritionally, but it actually eventually collapses on itself. So it's like, you know, this idea you were just sharing of why don't we all share the lawnmower, anytime we've even attempted that, we've maintained the same war with nature mentality, so we end up with something like communism, yeah. a far cry from what we want, yes. because it's still got the underlying war component to it, so it's forcing everyone to share. But at least we could step down. Right, like the ultimate yep. goal, the ultimate goal is is here, like society, that we replace the grass and put something that we don't need to fight against, something like clover. Okay, that's the ultimate goal. I had this conversation on the weekend with my my girlfriend's mother. Okay, who's probably listening, and we talked about like she's like, okay, well I have grass and this and that. And I don't know how we talked about grass, and I was like, why don't you try clover? Like you guys should totally just try a, a clover patch. It would it would restore the the nitrogen in the soil will be so much easier. It doesn't ever grow higher than this. Like it's so much, it's so much better, and it's more beautiful. And it you know, attracts bees. It's great for the environment. It's just good. It's just easier. And she was fighting me a bit on it at the beginning, and then at the end, she was like, "Oh, you know what? What you're saying makes sense." Now, is she going to do it? I, probably not. Not yet, right? Okay, but she's definitely open to it. And that's what's kind of that step. Where it's like, okay, well, the first thing we need to do is take these micro wins where it's like, hey, we're not going to fight this anymore. Grass, clover. Like, that's one win. Like, if we get that win, okay, yeah. cool. Now, how can we win other win, things? Actually. Yeah. How can we win other other little battles here and there? And and you said something that was really uh, wise, and I hadn't thought about this before, but you're right. Even even just growing organic and, and still going with that row mentality and not doing, like, the permaculture way of doing it, okay, where, where you're trying to, like, factory farm organic. Is still a fight. That's still like that's still just try, now you're trying to keep the pests out, but you're doing some natural things, or you're or you're building a building and making a greenhouse and like really fighting it. But you're still fighting it. We have to find ways to, to stop the fight. Yeah, we have to re, we have to recreate natural systems, and and that's our only hope out of this thing. Like I said, Egypt turned to a desert. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at these pictures of Egypt and, I mean, if you could imagine the thriving civilization there at one point, Clearly. that place wasn't dunes then, mm -hmm. right? Like, people have a hard time. I think they picture the Egyptians living there in those dunes. Like, no, that's not how it was. Yeah. And, and were they doing um, modern American, Canadian-style organic gardening? No. They, they had much better systems than we have today, mm -hmm. and yet they destroyed it. This organic movement is a great direction, but it's not the solution. Yeah. It can't be. It's still being done, like you just said. It's just, it's just a cleaner version of the same old, same old. Absolutely. And actually, that was the what, you know, organic was all there was, what, 100 years ago? Mm -hmm. yeah, it I wasn't working then either. It doesn't work. It's not a sustainable system. And on the grass thing, I just want to point something out. This is interesting to me. The obsession with grass I, I find fascinating um, and I could pontificate on all day. But we have this obsession in um, our culture with neoteny, which is the which is childlike characteristics. We like to try to carry them into adulthood. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we see this with our dogs. Like wolves eventually lose the floppy ears and the rolled up tail and the goofy face and mm -hmm. they become fierce adults. But our domestic dogs carry those childlike puppy qualities into adulthood, as do our cows. That's what domestication does that. And they, they talked about this on Cosmos the other day, the domestication of, of oh, wolves and oh, dogs. Oh, I've heard, heard about it. Yeah, that's you should totally right. watch that episode. It's great. Yeah, Cosmos is mind-blowing. But anyway. Oh, yeah. So, so neoteny we see in humans, too. It's the, like, shaved down bodies. It's the surgical augmentation to try to make us look like we're always at the pubescent phase, right? Mm -hmm. Like the idea of mature humans is unattractive to us now. So we suppress it and we hide the old people away in, you know, nursing homes and we don't want to see any of that. Um, and we do it with our grass. It's like the, the mowing of the grass is to keep the grass looking like it does as an infant. Mm -hmm. Mature grass is 
not even like when your neighbors are complaining before the grass is even mature, it's not even at teenage phase and they're freaking out. It's not Full even grown seeding grass or is over your head, gone to seed, right? This is mm -hmm. a, it's not like a, oh, let's go play, you know, football out on the grass when it's at maturity. It's over your head. Yeah. We don't allow it. We want to keep it at the childlike phase for some reason. This like artificial turf thing. It's just a weird obsession humans have. But, you know, we're obsessed with grass because that's what we're living on. The, our, our diet is basically composed of grass seeds we call grain. Mm -hmm. Grain is grass seeds. Humans have been obsessed and addicted to grass for a long time. You know, it's interesting when you're looking at this whole issue of, of agriculture, humans leaving nature, humans domesticating. It all really hinges on grains. Mm -hmm. It really does. It comes down to wheat and barley rice comes down to corn, grass <laughs> right it comes down to grasses that can be grown for their seeds and it comes down to an addiction to those seeds and those seeds are addictive for a couple reasons one reason is because they make us produce um opiate like compounds mm -hmm. and they have opiate like compounds and there's that sense of ah uh, there's that there's that feeling you get when you eat them but then the other thing is they're really e they're really easy to turn into alcohol Mm -hmm. Very easy to turn into alcohol. How long did it take the Mesoamericans to realize that mashed up cornmeal turned into beer in two days? How long did it take the Europeans, or sorry, the, the Mesopotamians to figure out that wheat and barley left in water as a, because that's how you eat it, right? You grind it into a porridge, mm -hmm. leave it sitting around, turns into alcohol, rice turns into alcohol. Eventually you can learn to distill those and make sake or you can make For hard sure. alcohol. But prior to agriculture, I don't want to give the impression humans never drank alcohol because we see in foraging groups the consumption of alcohol, but, but it's for very short windows of time when a certain fruit ripens mm -hmm. um, and they're able to make an alcohol from it and then they drink it like crazy till it's gone, usually in a week-long festival, mm -hmm. and then there's no more. But what we see is they do alter their consciousness. They tend to alter their consciousness with more sophisticated uh, entheogenic plant substances. But mm -hmm. what we see happens in civilization is those entheogens get restricted. Those substances that help you feel at one with your environment, help you connect spiritually to your world, those become prohibited. And what's encouraged is the consumption of the alcohol byproducts of the grasses that people are eating and addicted to. And those function like an atheogen. And they make us less able to connect spiritually. And they reduce our desire for freedom. Or they allow us to live in captivity and become to and tolerate it. We tame, we yeah. tolerate captivity because mm -hmm. our, our sense of our, our uh, the awkwardness of, of captivity is le is lessened for a time. And as long as we get to really rage with that a couple days a week, then most of us will stay in captivity very easily. But when we take, I love what you described earlier. You know, you do some entheogens and you're like. The first thing that happens, oh my God, this is captivity. I'm a slave and I'm in some kind of farm. You Why immediately am I doing this? That yeah. This isn't natural. This doesn't feel right. Oh my God, there's no way out. How do I get out? What if I wanted to get out? Oh my God, you can't. Ah! It's like you realize <laughs> it. And of course, those substances, which we've used all through our history, are illegal. And we're encouraged to drink the distilled alcohol of grass. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, you know, if you think about the slums, you think about all these riddled places with more and more problems and more and more just acceptability of certain things, you see way more, way more alcohol. You see way more like it's, it's, oh man, you're, you, every time I talk to you, I have this clarity that comes out <laughs> like, man, everything happened because of grass. Like that, that realization is <laughs> well, so true. The lawns, then, then you go, what's this thing with the lawn? I mean, cause it's not like the lawn. I mean, maybe people don't know this, you know, that, that the grasses that are on your lawn are imported. They're not even native species. No. They're, they're invasive species brought from other lands mm -hmm. and then kept in their infant state through all the, I mean, the amount of labor required to maintain it alone where obviously, as you've been through this a million times, where we could be growing food, but instead we want to grow the grass for no reason. And then it's not like people are really out doing stuff on their lawn either. I mean, it's just such a weird, it's a weird trip. Thing. I mean, you know, it's I saw so this stuff in, in Iraq where they are, they just simply can't grow grass because it's too dry. Mm -hmm. um, people impregnating their front yards with the material that's in commercial baby diapers, which is like a powder that when it gets wet turns to a gel. So they'll impregnate the sand with that so that they can hold water in that gel so that they can get grass to grow there so that they can have lawns. Oh, like, my God. Wow. 
My goodness, you know, it's the things we do excessive. for grass. If we did as much, <laughs> if we did as much for 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 the world as the things that we do yeah, for grass, for grass. Wow. <laughs> really That's so yeah. funny. It is so funny. But I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit because I I said one thing that um, we talked about the problem. The problem's there, and 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 now there's awareness of the problem, which we we brought it all down to grass, which is hilarious, <laughs> um, and it's so true though you're doing stuff, you're forging, you're, you're, you're teaching these techniques. And I want you to, to, you know, I, I don't know if you have to go anytime soon, but I want you to talk a little bit about what you actually do and, and what are some of the solutions that people can, can get to. Cause they're there. We, we agree we brought it down to grass. Now what, what can people do? Well, all right. So we can start thinking about creating our own habitat and you don't have to have a permaculture and earth ship to start creating habitat. You already have habitat. You're so <laughs> every one of us has our own habitat, right? We have our home that we live in. We have our apartment we rent. We have, you know, our room, our dorm, whatever we have. We have habitat now. It's just probably not the best habitat for us. So we can start saying, how do we make our habitat more like what would sustain our health and our with an eye towards our longevity? Mm -hmm. And how do we make it more natural for us? So here's a few things we can do. I like to break things down, habitat construction, I like to break down into four things, four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. Mm. These are the things we need, these are the basic things you need to keep an ecosystem going and a great example would be the ecosystem of a fish tank because it's, it's a self-contained ecosystem. It requires inputs from the earth, that's the food that we put in, stuff grown in the earth, in soil. It requires the water, obviously, in the tank. It requires air, that's what the bubbler thing puts in and it requires fire or light. That's the artificial light we put in there to replicate sunlight. Mm -hmm. Those are the four things we need to have good habitat. So in our homes, we can start with earth and start saying, what am I eating? That's where we can start. What am I actually putting in my tube? Um, what am I feeding to my gut bacteria? And we want to be on a continuum moving away from commercial food, industrial food, really, I think we could call it, and even now scientific food. On a spectrum, we're moving towards wild food Though most of us will never really get to a significant amount of wild food, it's the direction we point the vehicle in. Yeah. Right. So, so the you know it's like you know you might not make it to the North Pole, but you at least can head north. Mm -hmm. Right. So similarly, we can be going sort of to organic food, then to like local food, connecting in with our local food shed, eventually producing or foraging our own food is a really good direction. Water's another one. You know, we got to start asking ourselves, what water are we making ourselves out of? And that's why I created the findaspring.com website for people to find spring water. But if they're going to drink water that comes out of the tap, they really want to think about how do I make this water more like natural water? First thing you're going to want to do is remove the chemicals that have been leached out of the pipes, mm -hmm. the chemicals that are being added. Now, I know in Montreal, you guys don't fluoridate, mm -hmm. but you do chlorinate. Um, chlorine's an antibiotic. And that's There's probably a lot. just as worse, and if not you know, just and then, and then yeah, I mean, it's pretty gnarly stuff, especially when you realize you're filled with all of these bacteria you want to keep alive. And then, um, but they're also adding phosphoric acid and they're adding uh, sodium hydroxide to the water as well. Hmm. Those are, are alkalis and acids that they use to dissolve the buildup of minerals in the pipes. So all this stuff is being delivered to you. So you want to be oh. taking that out and then you want to find a way to remineralize your water. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but essentially a little bit of good quality sea salt, tiny amount will add some minerals back to your water. You don't want water that's totally stripped of minerals. Mm -hmm. and that's what a good filter is going to do. So if you use, let's say, reverse osmosis, now you've got a water that's actually not very natural because it has no minerals and that's not found in nature. Exactly. So, um, so we want some strategy for, for improving our water. Air is a big one. The air inside our houses, because our, our homes have become so efficient energy-wise, they don't have um, much draft anymore. And the air inside our house gets filled up with the outgassing um, um, volatile organic compounds from all the manufactured goods that we bring into our house, from our carpets to our couches to our floors to these computers, which are made of plastic and are outgassing all the time. Mm -hmm. So that fills up the air, and then we're breathing the formaldehyde right, and all the other molecules, and that gets into our bloodstream. So we want to have a strategy for keeping our air clean. I mean, the biggest thing is opening your doors and windows whenever you can. 
Next would be getting plants in your house. Plants will actually consume those volatile organic compounds and lock them in the soil or, or alter them. Mm -hmm. um, we want to maybe a HEPA filter to get all the dust, the dead skin out of the air. Maybe some of us might want some a way to get humidity back into the air, maybe a humidifier or a dehumidifier so we get the humidity in our habitat, our zoo habitat, right? Get it to where <laughs> we need it to be. And then I like using an ozonator um, mm -hmm. occasionally in my home where I blast ozone into the house just like what happens after a good rainstorm. The mm. last piece will be fire. We want to be getting the fire from the sun, full spectrum light. So the problem is we're living under all these artificial lights. They do not produce the light frequencies we need to produce vitamin D, melatonin, serotonin regulation or any of that. So we need to be getting outside and we need to be exposing as much of our naked skin to the sun as much as we can. Now, if you're more fair skinned, you need less sun exposure. If you're more darkly pigmented, you need a lot more. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, oh my God, the sun causes cancer. Well, it's like, here's how you cause cancer. You eat a really carcinogenic diet and then you burn yourself over and over again in the sun. That'll get you, yeah, that's a good prescription for cancer. But if you slowly and gently build up your tan you don't have to, and eat well, you do not have to worry about this. Now, here's when you, there's some caveats. If your people come from Scandinavia and you decide you're going to live in South Africa or England, that's a lot more sun than your skin can handle. Mm -hmm. If you're from if you're from Sudan and you move up to here to let's say Somalis who come to live in Maine, there's a lot of Somalian people here where I live. Um, they they literally cannot produce enough. They can't get enough sunlight here. Mm -hmm. Their skin is like uh, sunglasses. All of that melanin filters the the sunlight, so they can't get enough. They're designed to be in very very bright hot places where they would get more sun. So. We need to think about that. If you're, if you're African descended living in temperate climate, you need to be making sure you're outside a lot more to get enough mm -hmm. vitamin D uh, and to store enough vitamin D for the winter. If you are more light skinned, you want to be careful not to be burning yourself and that's important. But all of us need more sun. We're spending way too much time in artificial light, not enough time in natural light. Absolutely. So those are four strategies right there. And I'll add one more piece which is the, the, we need to move our bodies in new ways. Sitting in chair, see the natural human sitting position is a squat where your feet are flat, your heels are on the ground, and you squat down until your butt touches the backs of your legs or your ankles. Mm -hmm. That's the natural position humans actually rest in. And you might think, well, what about sitting Indian style on the ground? Well, I'd say, yeah, you live inside, don't you? Because when you're outside a lot, you realize that if you sit like that too long, you conduct your body heat into the ground. Mm -hmm. With all your thighs, butt, and, and calves on the ground, you lose body heat. So, and often the ground's wet or muddy or rocky and uncomfortable. So what's nice about squatting in the full squat position is that you have the same points of contact you would if you were standing, mm -hmm. right? It's a way that humans rest. And if you travel in the third world, you see that people sit all day in the squat. Well, we sit in the chair. And over time, we lose mobility in our knees and our hips. And we sit like as if we're sort of like robots. We don't actually use our bodies like animals. So for me, I have a standing desk with a pull-up bar positioned right over the desk. So if I'm working on my computer, I can be doing arboreal locomotion, swinging from up top while I scroll around. My house is full of things that I play on and climb on. I make it like, an, like you would. If you were going to buy a lizard and set up a terrarium, you'd think <laughs> – what, what can I put in here, like branches and rocks for him to play on and crawl on? Well, we don't do that for ourselves. So my so house is If you're up, a monkey in a house, you might as well set up some monkey bars, How would right? you set up the house? If, <laughs> if I was like, hey, I've got you a chimp. It's coming home to live with you. You'd be like, well, I've got to make this place more interesting, right? The chimp is not going to want to sit in a lazy boy and watch TV. Yeah. But we, we're doing that to ourselves. So like my house, I have an obstacle course in my yard. Mm. And, and I play on it and I move my body and I use my body like an animal does. So, so I think we can start to create, we can bring those four elements into our lives. We can bring movement into our lives and we can start to use ourselves a little bit more like animals and a little bit, think more ape, less angel. Mm. More ape, less angel, right? If that makes sense. We've been deluding ourselves. Like we fluttered down from the heavens and we're here <laughs> on this dirty earth. And we're like all dressed in white and with a halo. It's like, no, actually, it's the opposite. We're kind of like a type of ape yeah. and we've been, we've been masquerading as an angel. So, so think more ape and, and give yourself the freedom to live like that. Start to create more of a zoo. Get yourself out of the prison of the farm. I mean, I don't know if there's more, more to be said about that 
some real world examples of how you can how you can change your life, how you can you know earth, water, uh, wind, and fire. I mean, all of those elements. If you started doing some of those, you're going to unlock others. You know, if you start moving around a little bit more, you're going to have more energy. You're going to go outside. Maybe you're going to have more time or more more you know more energy to go out and farm. Or maybe you're going to set up a couple of things that you could forge on your front lawn. Maybe you're going to replace your grass with with uh, with, with clovers. Maybe you're going to you know what I mean. Like all those things play into it, you know, and, and last time we spoke, some of the things that you kind of said, I was like, man, I, I think about this like more regularly. And the more you learn, the more you actually, you do it. Like every once in a while, you find yourself in the room, you're in a dark corner in a bad position, you're, you're slouched over and you're doing whatever. And then you kind of snap to and you're like, oh, wait a second, I should open the door, I should do some stuff, maybe I should go s stand outside, yeah. I should stretch, I should Let drink more lighter. water, uh, whatever, like something, just anything, just Start doing pattern today. interrupt. <laughs> yeah, like just get out of there. <laughs> like yeah. just find your way outside. Go and even volunteer at a farm or anything. Just do something. Get out there. Yeah, go for a walk. Go camping is one of the biggest things. Like I often tell people, go camping. That's where all the action is. Like really, that's where it is. And and you know, I want to say on DanielVitalis.com, I have a, a huge archive of interviews and videos and. Most of my work is creating strategies. So if you're like, oh, that was kind of quick on the strategies there, I want to know more. I mean, I've got a ton of work. Check it out on my website. Check me out on YouTube. Um, I really do lay down a lot of strategies that are really, really effective. And I know they're effective because I use them and because so many people who I work with use them. So this stuff can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not only can it be done, it's way more fun than what you're doing now, I promise. It, I promise. Even just the research of it, whether it, it's less fun or more fun or whatever, just researching, learning about it is going to be fun guaranteed. If you go to his mm -hmm. website, you, you check out Val Movement, you check out – because we're going to do some links. I think we should we should definitely get you as a, as a featured blogger or maybe vice versa or something. We should definitely do more to, to – spread this information because we talk a lot about this kind of stuff at Valhalla, but we don't really, we don't have the same knowledge that you bring to the table. We don't have that same perspective that, that you, that you shed on, on some of these topics. Yes, and we're, we're connecting zoos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're having a hard time. You know, we, we, I don't think me myself alone would I have come down to the realization that it was all grass, <laughs> but, but you know, I think the more you look into it, the more you value this kind of education, the more you value this change in your life, the more it's going to adapt yourself to the current farm, to the current environment, and the more you're going to see your free range kind of expand. If you really just quit what you're doing that you know is wrong, just stop it and do something that is a little bit more productive. And it's not about like... You're here and jump here. It's you're here and then you could be here and then you could be here and you could be here and you could be here. And some people are going to take that full jump and some people are going to do the half jump and some of the people are just going to take this one step and never move any further than that. It's okay. It's okay. But but do it because I know it's calling at you. I know you're you're feeling it inside. I know everything about you when you're sitting in that in that office or in that building and there's no windows around you. I know you're freaking out. I know it. You're a human. And I know that it's not it doesn't feel right to you. So if you do what you feel is right, if you become the animal, I love that uh, that example. Don't be the ape, not the not the angel. If you if you become that ape a little bit more, and you you lower your standards, and you realize that there's nothing to, we shouldn't be fighting nature, we shouldn't be fighting any of these things, and that we should try and connect, truthfully connect more to it, and kind of put our cell phones away when we're on the toilet seat or whatever. Like if we try and like, you know what I mean? Like if we can come back to to a, a degree yeah. of consciousness. The, the path and all the all the information will will be there and one thing one piece of advice that I give to, to people all the time and I think it's actually worked best for me is try and revolutionize every little thing that you do take things that you do consistently like every day like clockwork and then think about it think like oh should I really be doing this like you know what I mean like every day you go yeah. in and you, you, you soap your body with, with some chemical crazy stuff and whatever like it's just think about what you could potentially do to improve that. And trust me, I'm not the. F I haven't taken all the full steps. I'm not here, okay. I'm I'm here and I'm moving and I'm moving along and I'm, I'm getting there because I was raised here and I get it and so are you. But we have to take that that path. That's you know maybe we might not hit the North Pole, but maybe we can head north. 
And yeah, it's going to take generations to get us there, right? So we do the steps that we can do now. And I think one important thing is like I, I always am thinking about hitting 90% of the time with the things that I want to do. So let me give you an example. I have a practice at the end of a hot shower I like to take. I like to turn the water all the way cold. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, multiple reasons I do it. But um, at first, that doesn't sound that fun, right? It doesn't sound that exciting. Um, eventually, it actually is. It, it's, 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 it's exhilarating, quite, yeah. But, but there's days where I don't want to do it. Like there's days where I'm like, no, and I don't. But I do it about 90% of the time. Over time, that, the effect of that gets me to what I'm trying to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I do it. So I'm, most of the time, I'm getting all the benefits from that thing. We want to be really careful about those things you were talking about, the things that we do every day. Because let's say that you have some kind of thing that you obsess over that you know isn't good for you. It's some destructive habit. Mm -hmm. And we zoom out and look at your life. If we see that you've done that 90% of the time, then 90% of the time you're getting all those negative effects. But let's say you can flip it. And you get that behavior down to where you're doing the thing you want to do 90% of the time and you only do that thing that's not so great 10% of the time. Then when we zoom out of your life, we go, ah, okay, that 10% doesn't really have that serious effect on you anymore. So it's not about I got to all the way do this or all the way do that. That's not sustainable. We know that when we set up those kind of rules, we just end up breaking them. But if we can get a most of the time pattern down, that's when we get really effective long-term results over the course of a lifetime. Absolutely. Look, I, I think we should end it here. I, I, I have more to say to you right after we end this. But if anybody wants to learn more about this, DanielVitalis.com, Sir Thrival, which is kind of his, I guess it's your online shop for some of these, yeah, these my product products line. and things that you've kind of uh, brought forward. Some of these things you can make on your own too. It's just that maybe this is the easier way. Maybe this is that step that you could just buy it and then you have the time and you could research and you could try it out. You know, if you don't want to put the time commitment into trying it, Maybe this is like the, the half step that you can kind of take to maybe get there. Take that 10% that of the time that you're doing the right thing and try and turn it into that 90. And that is, it, to me, it changed my life. It's changing my life because it's a, it's a process. And um, I know it's changed yours. And, and I know it could change anybody who's listening out there. Think about the small things. Act today. Don't wait. Get out of the farm. Hopefully head towards the zoo. Uh, and just... Come on, be a part of it. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what more to say, you know, like just be a part of it. If you're listening to this, you're clearly a part of it already. You're clearly in this mind space and maybe maybe there's that extra little thing you could do. So just just do it. So uh, anyway, thank you so much, Daniel, for, for being on our podcast again. Man, the, the, the things that you open up in my mind, <laughs> boiling it down to grass is, is hilarious. <laughs> Um, uh, I think it, I think it's going to be the title of of the blog post that I'm going to create to promote this. <laughs> <laughs> it all boils down to grass, something like that. Um, cool. But yeah, I mean, thank you so much for being for for just doing the things that you do and uh, and look forward to seeing some of your magazines and, and newsletters. And yeah, things like coming I, mean, out. I want to encourage people go to my website danielvitalis.com and and sign up for my free magazine. It comes out eight times a year on the natural solar calendar. So it's designed to sync you up to the equinoxes, the solstices, and the four cross quarters of the year. That's the ancient solar real deal calendar. And my newsletters, which you'll also be signed up for, um, which come out every new and full moon. So the idea is we use the magazine and the newsletters to sync you back up to natural time, which is another big piece of the rewilding process. But yeah, check that out. I'd love for you to see um, what we have going on there at danavitalis.com. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on this podcast and to to share with your people. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. All right. Have a good one, guys.